Hi everyone, welcome to Julie Reads Her Bookshelf. I'm Julie. Um, it's been a minute. I've taken a little bit of a hiatus from YouTube uh, that was kind of forced on me. I have been in China, my first time visiting the country in six years. And as some of you might know, China sits behind a firewall, uh, which means that a lot of the apps that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, like Google, YouTube, um, various forms of social media, and even things like Uber don't work in China. So uh, of course they have their own version of all of these apps and you have to subscribe to a whole new ecosystem once you're behind the firewall. Um, but for the last couple of weeks, I've really not had access to YouTube. So I'm back with a video about uh, my time in China, uh, going to bookshops uh, and buying some books. Uh, and I've got a little bit of a book haul today for you. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Chinese literature and, and why it is that we don't actually read much of it. Um, so I'm going to cut to um, uh, some clips that I took while I was in China and then I'll come back and talk a little bit about uh, what books I bought and, uh, and uh, why I bought them. The first bookstore I went to is Sisif Books in mainland China. This is a chain of bookstores that are all independent and all of them uh, are, have this kind of uniform, rich, woody look to them and they're kind of well stocked in both literature and non-fiction business type books uh, and they carry a selection of foreign as well as domestic titles. And here I can see that I picked up a copy of uh, Gone with the Wind and I really thought about it. It's a really popular book in China, which ironically isn't at all the case uh, in the West anymore. The second bookstore I went to is Eslite Books in Hong Kong. Um, this, this actual chain comes from Taiwan, but uh, the store in Hong Kong, particularly the one in Causeway Bay, is uh, one of the largest I have ever seen. There's three floors in total full of books of every kind that you can think of in English as well as in uh, traditional Chinese. Um, and it's absolutely packed full of people browsing at night. And here we have a very, very satisfying shelf of Penguin Black Spine as well as modern classics. Uh, as well as uh, the vintage Red Spine classics. Uh, a lot of the titles I've ac actually never seen before, uh, including the full set of The Story of Stone, which is of course a Chinese classic, as well as a translation of The Legend of the Condor Heroes, which is one of the most popular books in China. I was sorely tempted by this volume of George Orwell. And you can see around the store that there were plenty of people browsing and reading and just generally having a good time. And the top floor is, of course, uh, full of stationery, which is also pretty cool. The third bookstore I went to is Kubrick in Hong Kong. This is a bookstore situated right next to these giant residential towers. So it's actually a really lovely, quiet area. The bookstore itself is half a cafe and half a, a bookstore and Kubrick re refers to uh, Stanley Kubrick. So the bookstore itself has a, um, an artsy uh, film based focus. So there's lots and lots of books around design and films and, and also a lot of zines as well. The books themselves are organized by country. So you can see there that there's a shelf uh, on Italian literature, there's a shelf on Austrian and Czech literature uh, and that's a strange way I think of organizing books um, that's kind of uh, quite interesting because we don't tend to think of books in those purely country terms in the West and here you've got uh, some magazines about films and here I was taken by some translations of Jonathan Franzen's books um, I didn't know that he was such a popular author there. And finally, I also went to Spirit Books in Hong Kong, which is a wonderful little secondhand bookstore full of English and Chinese language books 
packed to the ceiling and the owners are kind of quirky and wonderful characters and quite close to Spirit Books is Commercial Books which is also uh, a bookstore uh, there's mostly new uh, books and also books aimed at students. Welcome back and now I want to show you my book haul. Uh, some of you who uh, have watched the first video to this channel might know that um, the premise of this channel is that I'm not buying any books uh, until I've read all of the unread books on my bookshelf behind me. But of course, um, there are a couple of exceptions that I gave myself. And uh, one of those exceptions is that I'm allowed to buy books when I travel because I quite like the idea of buying books as souvenirs. And the second exception is that I'm allowed to buy books in the two uh, foreign languages that I can read in. And one of them is Chinese and the other one is French. So I have a book haul. Uh, I bought a total of six books while I was away. Um, two are in English uh, and both of them I bought in Hong Kong. And the remainder are uh, in, uh, in Chinese and I bought them uh, in a mixture of mainland China and Hong Kong. So I'll just go through the first two English books. The first English book I bought was Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence, which I got at uh, Spirit Books in Hong Kong. It's a secondhand copy uh, in the lovely mint green spine um, of the Penguin Modern Classics. Well, I think this is, this is called the Penguin 20th Century Classics, which are the kind of the precursor to the modern classics. Um, I quite like these old editions. They're nothing special, but they're sort of really floppy and the font size is all really good. I've read this book. It's actually one of my favorite books. Um, and I have it in the, I don't know if you can see the Wordsworth editions behind me, but I'm actually slowly getting rid of all of my Wordsworth editions because I find that I'm not enjoying the physical experience of reading them. Uh, and once I've read them, even if I wanted to go back to a book to reread it, I'm, I'm not tending to return to those editions. So what I'm doing is slowly buying secondhand copies of uh, books in uh, my that I have in my Wordsworth editions and replacing them and putting those in the little free library down the street. So I bought this book effectively to replace the copy that I have of this book. Uh, and I do plan on rereading this at some point because I've been reading a little bit of Edith Wharton lately and I absolutely love her books. Um, so I'm, uh, and I read this a long time ago, I think while, while I was in high school. So it is well overdue for a reread, but I did absolutely love this book when I first read it. So uh, I'm really looking forward to returning to it at some point, probably not this year, probably next year. The second English language book I bought, which I bought from the bookshop Kubrick, is uh, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. It, it's a poetry collection and I'm not adding it to my list of unread books because with poetry books, unless they're epic poetry like the Iliad um, where there's a plot and you're clearly meant to read it from beginning to the end, um, with these types of poetry collections, I find my, my own preference is not to sit down and read it from the first page to the last page, but rather to dip in and out. What's more important to me is to really make a commitment to regularly reading poetry. Um, I had to buy this edition because look at it, it is beautiful. It's lo a lovely hardback. Um, it's not the, uh, the full deathbed ed uh, edition of this uh, particular work. It's, um, for those who don't know, Walt Whitman initially wrote Lisa Grass and then he sort of tinkered with it for the rest of his life. So um, it's not the full collection, but it is kind of the, the best of. Um, and I'm not sure that I want to read the entire thing from beginning to the end anyway, so it doesn't bother me that I have just a selection here. Um, what I love about it is that it's such a beautiful um, uh, object and uh, with beautiful end papers. The quality of the paper and the printing is superb. Uh, it's published by Give Smith, which is a, a publisher based in Utah of all places. Uh, and I'm not totally sure why a bookshop in Hong Kong stocks it, but it is um, such a lovely object that I just had to buy it. So those are the books that I bought in English. And I also bought four books in Chinese. Happily, all four of them uh, have English language translations. So I'll put the English language translations in the description box and I'll also give you some pronunciation notes for how to say the author's names because I, 
I think the way that some of these authors' names are spelt don't necessarily correspond to how uh, an English language speaker would think uh, that the names should be pronounced. But before I get into what it is that I bought, I do want to talk a little bit about this phenomenon of um, uh, why it is that we don't read more Chinese fiction in the West. Now I said that uh, all the books I bought have English language translations, but that's kind of a rare thing for Chinese fiction. Most books that are being published and sold in China aren't getting English language translations, certainly not major English language translations by major publishing houses that would see um, these books go into normal bookstores in the West. And I've also wondered why that is, and I don't have an answer for it, because if we look at Japanese literature, um, the likes of Murakami. Uh, the West reads a lot more of it and a lot more of it uh, gets translated and sold in Western bookstores compared to Chinese literature. And there's no real reason why um, there should be a discrepancy because there's a cultural gap that exists with, with respect to both countries. The language and the methods of storytelling can differ quite a bit with respect to both countries. So it's not really clear to me why people aren't translating and publishing Chinese fiction in the West. Um, but putting that aside, as I said, all of the Chinese books that I bought uh, have English language translations. So I will be reading all, all them in original Chinese, but um, hopefully this video will inspire you to um, explore some of these authors as well. The first book I bought is The Golden Age by Wang Xiaobo. And this is a book, that sold squillions after the author's death in China. So he, um, Wang Xiaobo, uh, wrote this book in 1992. He died of a heart attack in 1997. And since his death, he's sort of achieved a kind of cult status in China. And, the, and uh, this series of books, which starts with the Golden Age, but then goes on to the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, um, kind of, are kind of seen as defining a generation in China. Um, the Golden Age is set during the Cultural Revolution uh, and it depicts the everyday life of the protagonist who um, sort of has a long-standing affair uh, with, um, with a, a woman called Chen and he's sort of persecuted and shamed by local authorities. But the, the remarkable thing about this book is that it really uses humour and it uses sex and the awkwardness of sex to to show how a particular person comes to terms with the events of the Cultural Revolution and its impact on um, the lives of very ordinary, um, everyday people. So um, I I'm looking forward to reading this. Uh, it seems to be written in quite vernacular Chinese, so I think it'll be a relatively easy read for me. Uh, and so if you're interested, um, Penguin published the English language translation just last year. So this book was written in 1992, the first major English language translation, 2022. It took 30 years for someone in the West to go, mm, maybe we should translate one of the best-selling books in China. So this is the exact same kind of thing that I'm um, talking about, which is I don't really understand why it takes so long for Chinese fiction to be translated in the West and why there is so little interest in a country of 1.4 billion people that is incredibly influential in the world. Don't you want to know about what people are reading, what people are thinking there? I don't really get it. The second book I bought in Chinese does actually have a bit of profile in the West, uh, and that's The Three Body Problem by Liu Cixing. Um, now, this is, a, this, is, this is Chinese science fiction. It was uh, published in 2006. It received its English language translation in 2014. Uh, after which it won the Hugo Award, being the first book uh, from Asia to win the award. Uh, and it's, it's a science fiction novel set during the Cultural Revolution. I think this is the first of a trilogy uh, where uh, there was a secret military project to send signals into space to uh, sort of establish contact with aliens. And an alien uh, civilization does get contact and, uh, and it's a it has sort of starts plans to invade Earth. And this is uh, kind of about what 
the fallout is from that contact, as I understand. Now, I don't really have much background in science fiction, so I, I'm sort of a little bit daunted by this book, even though um, the, from just looking through it, the language isn't that difficult. Um, but I just don't have a great um, deal of knowledge of science fiction to be able to judge how good or bad it is. Um, but we'll see how we go. If it's, if it's gripping and fun, I think it'll be a great read. The third book I got also has some profile in the West, and that is Soul Mountain by Gao Xingjian. Now, Gao Xingjian is the first Chinese author to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in the year 2000. And uh, this is his book that's loosely based on his own life after he was given a false diagnosis of lung cancer. Uh, and it's part autobiographical, uh, part fictional about a man's journey through uh, the fabled mountain of Lingshan in China. As I understand, the book is kind of like um, uh, different fragments of this person's accounts of traveling, meeting different characters who uh, are mostly nameless uh, and kind of just a general mishmash of weirdness. So I'm not really sure how I feel about this book. One of the reasons why I bought it, I bought this book in Hong Kong, I should say, at Spirit Books. Um, and one of the reasons why I picked it up was because um, and you can probably see here um, on the front cover and on the, on the corner, it says uh, simplified Chinese version. And uh, for those who know a little bit about the Chinese language, um, there's two Chinese scripts. There's the traditional Chinese script and then there's a simplified Chinese script. Uh, the simplified Chinese script is used in mainland China and the traditional script is used in Hong Kong and Taiwan who never kind of went with the process of simplifying language. And um, so it was a curious thing when I picked up this book, which was published by a Hong Kong publisher and printed in, in simplified Chinese, which is not the script that is actually used in Hong Kong. And so I picked it up wondering, well, why on earth would, it, would a Hong Kong publisher decide to print a book in a script that is not the dominant script in their very own market? And of course, then I realized what was happening because Soul Mountain as a book is banned in China. And so um, the publisher in Hong Kong is obviously not printing for the Hong Kong market, but rather for uh, the market of Chinese readers, mostly from mainland China, um, who might be visiting or living in Hong Kong and who might want to read this book in a script that is slightly easier for them to read than the traditional Chinese script. So uh, kind of an in interesting um, political backstory to this book as a physical object. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to pick it up. But of course, uh, being uh, one of the major Chinese authors who have no profile in mainland China, but uh, has quite a profile in the West, I do want to read this book and I wanted to read it in, in the language that it was originally written in, which unfortunately isn't the language um, that it has sold the most copies in potentially. The final book I bought in China is actually a work of translated fiction uh, and it's uh, translated from Japanese into Chinese. Now you might be wondering why, why it is that I went and bought a book uh, that was written by a Japanese author in Chinese. But the reality is if I'm going to be reading Japanese fiction, I'm going to be reading it in translation either way. Either it's going to be translated into English or it's going to be translated into Chinese. And I have an entirely unproven hypothesis uh, that uh, Japanese translates better into Chinese than it does into English. So uh, I can't prove it uh, unless I have the same book side by side and I'm reading it side by side to see you know, what sounds more natural. But um, I was in a Chinese bookstore and, uh, and I saw that this was one of the bestsellers. And in fact, everything written by this particular author uh, seems to be a bestseller in China. So I thought I'd pick it up and have a bit of a read through because it's not an author that I that has quite the same profile in the West. Uh, I would say that the, the Japanese author that everyone reads in the West is, is probably Murakami followed closely by Mishima. But uh, this is uh, Journey Under the Midnight Sun by Keigo Higashino, uh, who is a Japanese mystery writer. And I'll just read the, the English language blurb. 
So as a 20 year old murder, a chain of unsolvable mysteries, can one detective solve this epic riddle? When a man is found murdered in an abandoned building in Osaka in 1973, uh, unflappable detective Sasagaki is, uh, is assigned to the case. He begins to piece together the connection of two young people who are inextricably linked to the crime, a dark taciturn son of the victim and an unexpectedly captivating daughter of the main suspect. Over the next 20 years, we follow their lives as Sasagaki pursues the case, which remains unsolved to the point of obsession. Dark, intriguing and stylish, Journey Under the Midnight Sun is an epic mystery by the best-selling Japanese author of The Devotion of Suspect X. So there you go, a little bit of a murder mystery. I'm hoping it's it's gripping and fast paced as murder mysteries should be. It's not a genre that I read very often, so it's nice to kind of mix it up a little bit. So there you have it. That's my little book haul from China and Hong Kong. We have uh, Journey Under the Midnight Sun by Keigo Higashino. We have Soul Mountain, published in Hong Kong, but in simplified Chinese uh, by Gao Xingjian. Uh, we have The Three Body Problem by uh, Liu Cixin and we have uh, finally Wang Xiaobo's The Golden Age followed by two English language books, this beautiful edition of The Leaves of Grass and The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Uh, and that's my very rare book haul on this channel. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you next time about books.